All right, everybody, this is Ross, the Fig Boss. Today, we're gonna to talk about figs. And um, I particularly wanted to show you guys the potted trees first, talk a little bit about this. Uh, we're gonna look at some of the in-ground trees as well, because um, kind of what's been going on this year, uh, as I've been looking around the patio, as I've been looking around at the in-ground trees, is that we're about a week behind this year. And I need to really check the, actually, the growing degree day chart which uh, I think Cornell has put out. Uh, we've talked about that in years past. Uh, and that's a good indicator exactly how much heat we've had so far this year, how many heat units we've gotten. And you can really actually use that Cornell tool and zero in on your exact location, your exact yard. And it'll give you a precise data, precise data on how much heat units you've received. And now it's not a perfect number, the growing degree days and how that relates to figs, but it's actually a good indicator just to see where we are at in the year. Where are we uh, compared to other years, compared to the 15 year average, compared to a 30 year average? Uh, and if I had a guess without really looking at it, I would say we're roughly five to seven days behind normal. Because as I'm looking at the figs this year, I'm not really seeing that much fig development um, in, in terms of where we should be at this time of the year. It's the end of May, it's May 31st. Uh, so I kind of feel like right around the 22nd and the 21st of May, which is what we saw last year, and I think even the year prior, uh, we had saw fig development, at least small figlets. Um, now there is development on these trees, don't get me wrong. And some of them have now been in the greenhouse for many months, they've come out of the greenhouse. There's main crop definitely on these trees and a lot of the main crop actually will ripen some of it will ripen in, uh, in July on these potted trees, but the majority of it, I think, is gonna ripen in early to mid-August this year, which is great. We've timed everything really well, but on the trees that did not receive a head start, they came out of the sunroom, we put them here on the patio, we did this after frost. I could have probably done that maybe a week or two earlier, get them out here on the patio as we were expected to have frost, but it actually never, uh, never happened. But in any case, you know, with all the circumstances we've had, it was a you know pretty, you know pretty lackluster spring. It was relatively cool, and then I think you know the the weather kind of playing the law of averages realized, oh, it's been rather cold. Let's add in some some super warm temperatures, and it really warmed up really quickly from about the middle of May onwards, uh, and we had even you know days in the 90s actually uh, that were definitely record temperatures. I would imagine they're record temperatures. And then today, we're, it's the last day of May, and it's gonna be like 96 today. So the nighttime temperatures have warmed over 60, and that's really the key thing there. It's not just the daytime temperatures, but if we could keep the nighttime temperatures over 60 consistently, the metabolisms of the trees with all that heat just goes crazy. So it, you, know, you have to look at the, the averages of the temperatures of the day and the nighttime temperatures, but from what I'm seeing so far is that we kind of are about a week behind in the fig development. I haven't really seen just exactly on some of these trees, the main crop production, as you can see on some of these branches here. Although actually this tree got a head start from the greenhouse. You can see it got a little bit sunburned. And look, here's actually a Braba and this is a main crop that's considerably far ahead. But if we look at even just the earliest varieties I have, we're kind of just now seeing the, the main crop development here. Uh, like here is um, a variety called uh, Azolodo, which is a variety that's green and elongated and dries on the tree. It doesn't really taste very good if it doesn't dry on the tree, but this one I imagine actually is quite an early fig. And you can see right in there, I know it's difficult with the shadows, but there are tiny, tiny main crops forming in there. Not as progressed as maybe I would expect. Now, if I go to a hardy Chicago, because typically last year it was the Sangua Dulce that formed main crop first. Here is Norella. I decided I really like this variety. In fact, we're trialing a number of hardy Chicago types again this year. Uh, after eliminating some, I have uh, Navid's Dark Greek, we have Norella again in the trial, Azores Dark obviously, Conde, and then I even have a Malta Black now in a container to kind of compare. But Norella now has 
fig development. Um, and you can actually visibly see these figs now. So I would count this kind of as where we were at last year, but that was the 21st to the 22nd of May. And now we are, you know, at the, uh, the end of May, it's the 31st. So we're, we're, I think, a week behind where we normally are. And that's just doing an evaluation. Uh, we actually have a Smith Breva here. We've had a few Smith Breva so far, and there's some actually way back in there on that tree, which has a ton of Breva. Uh, but uh, those are trees that came out of the greenhouse, and that's the only way I'm actually able to ripen figs in May, which is pretty awesome when that happens. Um, here's also, I just want to point out a really standout variety. This is La Bourgeoisie. This is a Breva of La Bourgeoisie, and it did get a head start in the greenhouse, but uh, it's such a great grower, this fig. It's pretty amazing. Um, so it puts out, you know, good growth every year, but the figs are just as prolific and vigorous, it seems like, as the, as the growth itself. So there's a, you know, Brabas on this tree, quite a few Brabas actually. I think it's four Brabas on this relatively young tree. Yeah, there's four Brabas and the main crop has grown super well um, because it's such a good grower. It seems to be relatively disease free. Yeah, th there was some sunburn and that actually has slowed it down. All the trees that came out of the greenhouse for the most part got burnt this year. But this is a really surprisingly super good grower and fruiter. Uh, same thing with this tree, whatever this is. Let's see. Oh, this is, I think, Fawne. But Fawne to me uh, seems like it's going to be a winner here. I'm really excited to actually see what indeed this really is. Uh, I got this from a grower in, I think, Massachusetts, and uh, I was worried that this was a hardy Chicago type. I fruited it last year, and it had a similar shape um, to a hardy Chicago, but it wasn't, and it didn't ripen properly. I have actually planted one in the ground. This was an air layer I took off the one in the ground. You can see it's grown really well, and uh, the leaves, in my opinion, don't match a hardy Chicago. They look like a hardy Chicago in the feel and that sandpaperiness. But uh, that one, I think, is the most, I'm the most excited for that particular variety that's in terms of new varieties. Um, we also have over here, I just want to look at this really quickly, is some graphs. I probably have about a 75% take rate this year on the graphs. Here's some. Uh, Verdino del Nord that I grafted onto Raspberry Latte, a super vigorous variety. Here's another uh, Verdino del Nord graft. Some of them I hope will actually grow because it looks like the buds want to expand, but they have not. Um, what we need to do from this point, by the way, guys, is take off this growth that keeps popping up on the rootstocks because that's the only real way, assuming the graft has taken the only real way that this is going to grow from those locations. You have to keep removing that stuff. Um, we also have another one over here. This is another Verdino del Nord graft. We have a Verdolino graft over there. There's some Black Celeste grafts, another Verdino del Nord graft. So we have pretty, really actually, really good success this year. This one I don't think is taken. This Black Celeste graft looks like it took, but it hasn't grown away from the, the bud just yet. Here are two Black Celeste grafts that took, and then here's actually another Vertolino that took, and it looks like it really wants to grow away. Uh, these were all done, believe it or not, probably two or three weeks ago, roughly. I think it's been about two weeks, at least two weeks. So this is the amount of time it takes. We also had uh, even some over here that I, I was kind of really smart this year, and I decided to graft onto some of the varieties that um, have dropped figs for me. So some of the varieties like Perola, Great Black is another one. Uh, Recover from Thierry actually has dropped fruits for me. And uh, I decided to go ahead and graft, you can see a graft union down there that actually took a different variety onto those trees in the event that uh, they drop once again for me. 
Here's actually the great black tree that I have. Here's a Brava on it, which I'm excited to see if that will ripen. Because this will give me an estimation of maybe it's a, you know, a San Pedro or a Smyrna, or maybe it'll be common, who knows. But I've grafted different varieties onto them in preparation for them to continue to drop. And it's worked out, actually. I was really surprised to see that they took and they're actually growing away because the dominance not necessarily I thought was going to be there. Uh, so this is a really, a really nice thing actually. Um, the only thing I think left to do is to just kind of support these graphs. If the varieties indeed continue to drop figs like I, I'm predicting them to, uh, well then I'll just chop off the variety itself that is going to drop the figs. and keep the variety of course that I grafted and then now I'm not wasting a season uh, realizing again that this tree is going to actually continue to drop figs. We're also going to experiment this year at some point with hand pollination. Uh, the capra fig in the greenhouse uh, put out a number of Brava's profici. I don't know if I can harvest the pollen. So far I have been unable to really get uh, an adequate fig off of those trees to be able to tell, oddly enough. Uh, the younger trees are growing super well. And that's, I think, a lot to do with the fertilizer this year. I'm using a different soil this year. Um, but the fertilizer last year, we just didn't really use a ton. I, and some of the trees, actually, I didn't use the Osmocote. I used chicken manure, and it didn't last very long. Um, and I don't think it was enough. But we tried different products this year. This is Coast of Maine. A lobster compost and then I also have the bumper crop from um, the same company actually that is Coast of Maine. They're both organic. It says Master Nursery on it. Organic soil builder. It has mycorrhizae in it. Um, I didn't like the potting soil from them because it has mostly peat moss and, and perlite and those are two products that things grow really well in but I just I don't really like using them uh, in my mixes. Oh, look at this. So here's a tree that uh, is in a container and I've been watering these trees actually twice daily because it's so warm as it's 96 degrees today. I have them all hooked up to irrigation finally and uh, have them on a timer. And this is the time of the year you really want to water them because the more water we give them, the better they're going to grow. The better they grow, the more figs we potentially have. So we're trying to uh, make them grow but this one here it's clear that this pot doesn't have any holes in it so I need to get underneath there and actually drill some holes that's a good thing I've spotted that because that could have definitely impacted the health of that tree for the rest of this season um, so that's really good we also have melons by the way in containers that's a whole experiment to see if I can get uh, really sweet melons by constricting and uh, limiting the water. Oh, I did want to mention all the way over here. Totally forgot about this, but I've got some trees back here too. And uh, this is my Paradiso from Bode, and it actually has a number of Brabas on them. I cannot wait to taste these Brabas. They are massive, uh, so that's not good because they're probably going to split. But we'll see what happens. Um, there's actually another graph back there. I grafted that on a pew fine, which translates to uh, fine skin. And that was supposed to be a really special variety, but it's been dropping for me. But I know that uh, Big Bill in Lancaster has ripened some fruit. So we'll see what happens with that variety. But I was like, you know what? Before I knew that knowledge about Bill, I was like, you know, I probably should plan ahead and graft something onto that. Over here, actually, these younger trees, like I said, I was getting to before, they really have grown super well. Um, and at this stage, I think with these younger ones, it's pretty simple. I'm just letting them go crazy, uh, letting them grow in every which way direction. When I come in here in the winter, in the fall, when I do my pruning, I'll prune out the unhealthy growth. Maybe at that time, if it's just a very unhealthy tree, like I probably imagine this Pepone here will be unhealthy for the unforeseeable future. I will cut that back to something extreme and rejuvenation prune that. So some of these are a bit of a year, like a work in progress process, I should say, for 
uh, you know, many multiple years, but eventually we get something really healthy. And that's what you stick with as the main trunk of the tree. But there are some good uh, varieties in here that are rather new that I'm expecting good things from. Uh, actually, quite a few that I've already really had higher hopes for, I went ahead and already planted them in the ground. Uh, I had a number of spots we talked about with the in-ground trees that we, we looked at not too long ago. Um, I went ahead and actually planted in the ground some varieties that I have higher hopes for in terms of uh, them working out. I, already, I had so many spots in the ground, I probably had over 30 different trees I could plant, and I only had about eight trees that were in a position to be planted. Um, what I decided to do, this is a couple varieties really quickly. This is Lampira 1. I actually have one in the container. The one in the container is going to fruit uh, at an early date, whereas the in-ground tree I have on the other side of the property is probably going to take some time and probably will ripen at the end of the year like it did last year and the year before. Uh, but for me, I'm like, you know what, I'll take some air layers, which I did, to kind of guarantee myself a little bit of easier uh, way of fruiting the tree. And that's what happened. So, but because that pot of tree is gonna fruit, I decided, you know, I'm gonna plant this other one in the ground because I know it's such a special variety. The other thing I've done is the same, ex same exact thing with this tree. This is Barnasote from UC Davis. They're actually mowing the lawn next door right now. Uh, so that's why it's pretty loud. But um, Barnasote from UC Davis, super underrated not talked about variety uh, i'm seeing such huge potential in this variety from other growers that i just finally decided to take the leap uh, it took me years i could have had this variety many many years ago the problem is it's not a very healthy tree so there's a lot of fig mosaic virus but this tree now i've had in a container for a year planted it in the ground it actually has good uh, fruit production this year the main crop will form and it's going to form very quickly. I already see very small figlets. So I felt comfortable enough planting this tree in the ground because I wanted to guarantee, like I said, with the Lampira 1, kind of guarantee myself fruit production to really further evaluate the variety. So I'm, I'm doing the same thing with this tree, but I'm you know, killing two birds with one stone, right? I'm getting the fruit production I wanted, but I'm also putting this in the ground, getting it more established so that next year, when we rejuvenation prune this, it'll be super healthy for the, the following years to come. Uh, so that's really critical for me, at least. And it's a very similar situation with most of these varieties. Here is a Marsa Lazy that we planted. This is a variety that dries super well. And because of those drying capabilities, it's going to do really well here. Uh, it does tend to split, I've heard. So we'll have to see how all that works out. Um, but uh, yeah, some other ones here is Bosco Rosso. This is a Nikki variety. I also planted, uh, what is this guy down here? Maybe this is Bosco Rosso. Oh, here's the tag. This is, oh, Luisa's Fig from Peter Kinderi. Uh This is a Staten Island unknown that's been in, uh, an heirloom fig that to me looks like a type of Celeste. Uh, it could be a type of Hardy Chicago, but I actually think this is Black Celeste. And believe it or not, I think Luisa's family, who this comes from as uh, a French origin, if I'm not mistaken, which is where Black Celeste has originated. I'm almost convinced that uh, that's kind of where that fig is from. So we'll see what, that hap what happens with that. I got an air layer one for, uh, for Peter. Another good one here is 505H. Uh, I saw some uh, photos of this and I thought, wow, this is a seedling. It was proven common and it just looks like it's such a good fig for this climate. Uh, it almost looked a little bit like Verdino del Nord or Fregoin, but looking at the tree itself, it doesn't match that so far at all. So we will see what happens. It's got figs on it as most of these either have figs on them in a container plant or they have figs on them in the ground and I went ahead and planted them. Uh, same thing back here. This is um, another actually interesting unknown called Madigan. And Madigan is a fig that uh, Danny Gentile found. And I forget actually 
I should have looked at some photos of that again. Because it's been a long time since I remember even what the shape is. But at a, he, Danny Gentile, the owner of Figbit, actually put out a number of New York City heirloom figs on Figbit and gave them out for very cheap prices. And I was able to get a cutting of Madigan from Danny. And uh, to me, it was the only one really worth my... It looked like the only one that was going to be you know, really good in a humid place. Obviously, they're heirloom figs. They're probably going to do well in the Northeast in general. But uh, to me, that one looked like it had the most promise. And actually, promise in terms of just figs in general, in terms of varieties in general. So I was pretty excited about that. Uh, and I went ahead and planted one in the ground back there. Uh, we also planted, I know, an Ishia Black UC Davis air layer that I put in the ground. Um, but things are coming along here in the yard, even though considering, like I said, we are a bit behind. But very soon this whole thing here is going to turn into a jungle. Uh, it's going to be incredible how fast this stuff is going to grow. Uh, it's crazy. So anyway, guys, thank you for watching this one. We'll see you for the next one. Talk to you guys soon. Take care and hit that subscribe button. We'll see you soon.